I had heard about Tammy Faye Baker because I grew up around the time of their empire. I had known about her as a tabloid figure and how they would make fun of her. Jessica and I are playing characters that are known, not only real, but especially with Tammy, I think people have a very defined image of who they are. They just seem like spectacles to me. There were so many falls right around that time of, of televangelists, and I did initially lump Tammy Faye in with the rest of them. I definitely remembered her as the sort of SNL punchline. She created this mark on society and kind of spelled out greed in the 80s. She was just a part of culture. Everybody knew Jim and Tammy. Remember, God loves you. He really, really, really does. does. My perception of her from the very beginning was that she was someone who cried all the time and had mascara running down her face, because that's what you'd see in all the jokes about her. And I thought that she was a thief, that she and Jim Baker had stolen millions of dollars. This is my preconceived idea of her. And I saw the documentary, Eyes of Tammy Faye. I think any time you deep dive into people's stories, you get a fuller view of people that you've only viewed through the media and only through kind of what you saw on the cover of a tabloid. That documentary really got to know her and what she stood for and the glimpse behind society's judgment of who she was and to who she actually was. This woman was much more than just a face with a lot of makeup on the cover of a magazine. And I thought, oh my gosh, why hasn't anyone ever made this film and told her story? It's not over till it's over. She's a woman looking through her life and coming to terms with what God's love means. What is God's love? What is it to be loved by another human being? What is it? to be loved by something bigger than yourself? What is it to be good enough for love? What is it to love without judgment? What is it to be accepted? And what is it to forgive yourself? So it's this woman's journey to all of that. It's exciting to get to know these characters and to hopefully create a really multi-dimensional point of view about who they were because they weren't just tabloid villains by any stretch. I think they came to it very honestly, and they had a real longing to heal people and to actually create a joyful version of Christianity. Tammy really thought Jim could accomplish anything he set his mind to, and I believe that's what she saw in him. Jim Baker is a powerful man. Yes, he is. Tammy Faye Baker. They are outliers, and they are trying to do something that's entirely theirs. They were groundbreaking in a lot of ways. There is a forward direction. The two of them are able to kind of spread the word of, of God in a way that wasn't necessarily accepted in that time period. They were radical in that world because there was a kind of gray, buttoned up, very puritanical image of what Christianity was. It was very fire and brimstone and suffering in this life means bliss in the next. And Jim just flipped it on its head. Jim just went, look at this passage right here. God wants us to have abundance, wealth, joy, and all of the good things of life right here, right now, in the promised land. God does not want us to be poor. Ho, 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 no. And then when they started to get on television, they created this kind of wild alternative for people. She looked into the camera and told Christians, we need to be better. We need to band together, and we need to reach out our hand and love those that are different than us. I love you so much. <laughs> I love you. My friends are gonna be so excited when I tell them that I met you. She crossed boundaries in a way that nobody else was doing at the time. She reached out to an AIDS patient when no one would even be in the same room as an AIDS patient. And how sad is that? That we as Christians, who are supposed to love everyone, are afraid so badly of an AIDS patient that we will not go up to them and put her arm around him and tell him that we care. And so we invited Tammy Sue Baker to set, and it was the day we were doing the Steve Peters interview, because that to me was the reason I really wanted to make the film and tell Tammy's story, because I think that was a rebellious, incredible act of compassion that Tammy Faye exhibited, and I wanted to celebrate that. So she was there that day, and there were a lot of tears She's been in situations where her family's been examined over and over again. And the sweet thing Tammy said is this is the first time that people reached out to us. 
In the past, things would get made and no one would talk to them. And I loved that because I loved them being a process of our film. I want to put my arm around you. And I want to put my arms around you, Tammy Faye. <laughs> I think Jim and Tammy, in a lot of ways, were entertainers. I think they both had that desire to be seen and accepted and validated by fans and to create an audience and to preach to that audience. Amen! Amen! It was absolutely a reality television show. And when she'd get emotional, she'd cry. Things that no people would think, oh, how embarrassing. She would just do. She, she was just who she was. And people would tune in for that. In a sense, the bubble bursts in many ways, both in terms of their relationship and in terms of the kind of empire that they were building, and it has a very Shakespearean, epic quality to it. I've seen the rich, and I've seen people with little who are more blessed. I think it was all about ascending for them. It's all about the light, going towards the light. And I think there's a real kind of rejection of the dark. And we all know what happens when we reject the dark. The dark doesn't really go anywhere. You can't have light without dark. And I, and I think that may have been a part of the downfall of the ideology that they were trying to live out. Your midnight's almost over. And thank God the sun is going to shine again. It's really interesting to see how Tammy Faye in particular, who really loses everything, but maintains this core belief in the spiritual principles that she started out with. Yeah, I won't go forward looking in the rear view mirror of my life. She really was the embodiment of what she preached. She wrote four books, she had 24 albums, all this stuff, she never got paid for it. All of her money went into the church. Looking at Tammy and, and uncovering the layers, taking off the makeup, so to speak, revealed a human who wanted to give love and receive love. And there was something more to her than just simply somebody who, you know, amassed jewels and clothing and makeup. And there was a humanity behind all of it. You can talk about me. That's all right. But, you know, you got to shake my hand and you got to say hi first. And all the stuff about the mascara running down her face, I studied her for seven years and I never once found footage of mascara running down her face, actually. She was a waterproof mascara kind of gal. Who would like a picture? There's a core message that Tammy had of love, of love and acceptance. She's someone that is relevant no matter what time you're in because she is someone who says that you need to love everyone. Everyone is deserving of love without judgment. We're living in a time where there's so much fear of the other, and Tammy was someone who threw her arms around the other and cherished the difference in them because we were all connected by one thing, and that's love. And so I think that's a story that is very relevant for any time you're in, and it's something that was very important for me to tell. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Tammy Faye Baker is gonna sing her gospel all around the world. We are gonna spread his word. It's an amazing thing to be able to work on a film like this with such incredible actors. The cast is unbelievable. It feels like we're such an acting troupe. From the very beginning when we were talking about this film, I was just thinking like Andrew would be so incredible. He's an actor who really puts everything that he has into what he's doing. He goes so deep into his character through research and through his own process of really embodying Jim Baker and studying Jim Baker and imagining who he is. I think Jim is a complicated person. I think he has light as much as he has dark. It's just fascinating to me. Andrews really found a humanity to Jim Baker and created this incredibly complicated, deeply flawed, but also really compelling character in Jim. He's an incredibly soulful actor, and he too has a very similar approach to creating character as Jessica does. What I loved so much that Andrew did is he knew the character so well that he allowed space for improvisation. And every take was a bit different, and it really felt like we were in what we were doing. And it's fun to kind of have that back and forth with someone. It's very rare when someone has that kind of confidence. People who have sown seed in the word of God, their stock is always up. Some of the, my favorite scenes to shoot have been the recreation scenes, because it's a different muscle that I don't often get to use as an actor. It's like doing choreography. So you're, you're doing kind of this very intricate, subtle choreography with your face, your 
body, your voice, the other person, the rhythm of the scene, the words, but you also have to fill it with soul. So that's just a really fun and impossible thing to attempt to do. So that's been really interesting. God loves you. He really does. Bye bye. Vincent D'Onofrio plays Jerry Falwell, the person who Jim and Tammy think will come in to save their ministry when they are hit with a lot of hardship. Vincent has in Jerry Falwell taken what could be a sort of a two-dimensional villain role and again created something that's very compelling and very fascinating. Well, bless your hearts. Look at the two of you right now, so very pitiful. It's interesting when you play parts like this because the main story is the Jim Baker and Tammy Faye story. And so structurally, where my character fits in the story is what I mainly pay attention to and how to service the story properly. <laughs> We're gonna have a Coliseum. Coliseum. Yes. Are you planning on sacrificing Christians? He really is approaching him from a place of both authority and menace. You need to understand how powerful we are in this fight for our nation's soul. Jim and Tammy definitely go up against him. We should just stay out of it and keep politics out of the Too church. much on the line. Falwell over-articulated words, and he tried to strengthen his Virginian accent up to make it more presentable. And so it gave him a weird inflection at times. I don't see the repentance there in a very kind of showy way of talking, even when he's talking naturally to people. Vincent is a shapeshifter. He thinks about acting in another way, and he's so excited about creating something different than, than he is. You understand that I can't allow you to stay here. Your home and everything in it belongs to the ministry. Cherry Jones is one of my favorite actors. Her energy is, is fantastic, and she just immediately became this character, and she's brought a warmth to the Hurt character that wasn't necessarily what we were thinking it was going to be. Well, when you first meet Rachel Grover, she was a woman under a lot of stress at home, and in this script, very terse, very seemingly condemning. What'd you do? The biggest challenge for me with Rachel, honestly, was to try to portray a woman whose life had been this hard. Because even when she's saying things that she means in a loving way, they sound so awful. <laughs> they really do. Little girls go to hell for lying. At one point, she's saying lovingly, you can't look away now, Tammy Faye. Hell is calling. Now, how do you say that in a really warm, motherly, loving way? He has planned for us. God or that gym boy? God. What did he tell you to do this time? You can see through Cherry's performance that at its core, there's this deep, deep love for her daughter, and she doesn't want to lose her to something that she feels is kind of eating away at her daughter's soul. She can't help but have this tenderness. What comes through is just this beautiful heart. I look like a bear. You look like a beautiful bear. Oh. It's, it's too much. She was so generous to me and loving and to actually be really in scenes with her. Working was so exciting. She's just the real deal. She has this kind of elegant, soulful kind of thing. Oh, Tammy Faye, you follow blindly. In the end, all you are is blind. It's God's voice through my voice. It's the world's ears. The things you say, Gary. In our film, we have the role of Gary, who is a music producer who's come up from Nashville to produce some of Tammy's records. He becomes a character who really builds her up in a time where she's feeling a little bit distant from Jim. As I started researching and understanding Gary, I realized he's a bit of a, of a wanderer, a bit of a vagabond, a, a traveling man. And, and, and then strangely enough, you know, he grew up in my hometown of Tucson. That's really where he made his mark as a musician. And that's where I got started as a musician. I haven't been this excited about working with an artist since I produced Monster Mash. That's really sweet. Mark was so great and so perfect for the role of Gary and really understood what Gary needed to be vis-a-vis -vis what Jim wasn't. We really liked creating a character there who was able to see a sensual side to Tammy that Jim was not seeing or was not paying attention to. When's the last time that you were touched? Gary exercised a rather large influence on Tammy Faye in a short amount of time, but the impact that Gary had upon them was rather profound. <laughs> the whole project is just filled with incredibly colorful characters, and then you get Jessica to be a producer and Michael Showalter to lead this whole thing up, and it's impossible not to immediately get immersed into the Tammy Faye world that they've created here, so it's a blast. It's cool. 
Is that okay without doing this? Absolutely. You don't even do that. Okay. I had been working with Jessica Chastain and one of the other producers, Kelly Carmichael, on a different project. He just had all of these ideas about PTL and what happens in their relationship and how to tackle the downfall. We just were like, okay, he's the guy. I loved the script. I talked to everybody about my vision, how I saw the movie, how I thought the movie could feel. We really wanted to find a director who was going to be able to infuse the story with humor and joy and be able to tell it in a respectful manner, but not a dour kind of morality tale. Michael brought so much to the film. First of all, he's just has a sense of play all the time about him. You know, we could do that. Me and Jess tend to get heavy. We, we tend to get serious. We can get lost in some heaviness. And I think one of the amazing things about Michael is that he's keeping us buoyant, because Jim and Tammy are buoyant. And I think Michael is just so incredible at making sure it's balanced in that way. <laughs> we really wanted to be able to find the fun, and he brought that to it alongside the weightier, heavier scenes. So let's go one more time. Michael has to constantly be balancing the ludicrous nature of it all with the emotional nature and the innocence of Tammy Faye. So I would imagine for Michael, it's a constant balancing act between the humor and the pathos and the genuine nature of that woman. You know, I don't pretend to be something I'm not because what you see is all you get. His take on the whole project has just really opened it up in a way and he's mining some of the human comedic moments out of them while staying true to the drama. He says one little thing and then he, he leaves you alone and lets you do your thing. And, uh, you know, he's one of those guys that can come in and say one thing and change your whole performance for that day. He will give you the opportunity to find it yourself. And when you don't, <laughs> he'll just dive in there and give you what you need. He loves actors. Michael loves Vincent D'Onofrio and Cherry Jones and Andrew. And he really wants to see them do their best work. So he inspires that. Go ahead, audience, go ahead. Well, hello, everybody. Hi, I will say this is the best part I've ever had in terms of the challenge. A lot of people have misconceptions of who Tammy Faye was, and so it's important that I tell her as she was, not as people want to remember her. Oh yeah, this is who I am. Tammy is so rooted into Jessica's part, and that's an amazing place to come from. And you kind of follow her into the fray because of that, because she's so passionate and she's so devoted. I think that she's one of the best actresses around right now. And I'm very impressed by her. We're all reaching for the bar that Jessica sets on a daily basis in terms of her preparedness, the sort of level of the performance, the depths that she's willing to go to, and then adding to it. Jessica is the most professional, thorough, diligent, talented actress that I've worked with. It's pretty unbelievable to see what she's actually been able to do to inhabit this character. <laughs> it's a huge challenge, but you can tell she is prepared beautifully. I saw her script, her Bible, and there were a thousand tabs sticking out of it because she's in practically every frame of the movie. I was very lucky in that the documentary filmmakers allowed me to view hours and hours and hours of footage that they had had to just watch of her. And so even her normal speaking voice from when she was young, and then when she's in the documentary and she's speaking, that changes. The accent's the same. She's from International Falls, Minnesota. She definitely didn't have a southern accent. She, you know, she speaks in a Minnesota accent, and that's what makes her so sweet and folksy. Well, hello there, Tammy Faye. Susie and Allie have accents, of course, because Tammy has an accent. Oh, this is a fun song, boys and girls, so hit it, Allie! She only talked quite low. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so! Susie was like a six-year-old girl. Do you know about God, Susie? Oh, I do. You know how sometimes kids sing, they, they don't have vibrato and they just kind of yell? That's how Susie sang. Yes, Jesus loves me! The Bible tells me so! <laughs> Tammy Faye is iconic, and she's funny, and she's silly, and she's always wanting to make other people happy. Tammy was always at an 11. <laughs> she was never at like a two where I'm gonna like dip my toe into this song. She always like started out like, I'm here, you know, like she was a full on belter. People don't give up, you're on the brink of a miracle. Jessica is an amazing singer and does unbelievable singing in, in the movie but also just the mannerisms. She's giving a, a performance that's very funny at times and incredibly vulnerable. Okay. <laughs> Jesus keeps me higher and higher. 
she's obviously an incredibly trained actress, but also to train your voice to sing in the way that someone sang is very specific and it's very detailed. Unreal. That was a perfect first take. <laughs> this is so good. I wanted to look as much as I could like her so I could also connect to a sense of like, I don't know, just to feel different. Just the physical cost of doing this role is so tremendous because she is encased in latex, wigs, trusses, pregnancy pads, nails out to here. I don't even know how to describe what it must feel like. It's many hours every day to create that effect that you're looking at Tammy Faye, and it's been an incredible process of discovery. We go from the 1960s all the way up into the 1990s. So throughout that process, we have three different major prosthetic milestones within it. So up until the early 80s, this is stage one. Jessica has two cheek pieces, a small chin blender, and a little nose lift that she wears all the way up until the early 80s. 1985, it switches to what we call stage two, which is full cheeks, full neck. She also has a different chin blender and a nose lip and an upper lip with that. And then the final stage, 1990s, stage three, full neck, aged cheeks, different chin, different lip, no nose, and then she gets a certain degree of aging and stipple that's put around her eyes. I don't know that I could have done the character without it. I don't know how to separate the two. The prosthetics were her in some aspect. Have you never done pictures without those eyelashes? Nope, nope, and I never will, because that's my trademark. And you know, if I take that away, then it's not me. Not only do we have the prosthetic element, but there's a real beauty element here. And no matter what people may think of Tammy Faye's style of makeup, it was her way of beautifying herself. Linda had special lashes made. She had things to make my lips look smaller, because I have bigger lips than Tammy did. So she would just do all of these things that absolutely transformed my face and transformed my look in a very strong way. For me, what was lovely was to look at her when she was younger, where she began, and how she moved into the makeup, and we wanted to see that progression. So we see the freshness and the hope in her more youthful look. And as we progress, all the colors for her in terms of her wardrobe, her makeup, even her nails, everything got a bit darker. <laughs> Linda got a lot of reference material. I knew that I was gonna have at least eight to 10 wigs. We have brown, we have platinum blonde, then we had a dirty blonde with roots. And actually one of the wigs, I actually used a frost and tip to make it exactly like Tammy Faye. Hi there. It's an incredible process of not knowing if you're gonna get there. And then when you see it, you're like, oh my God, there, there you are, we did it, you know? And so they've done an unbelievable job. You look great. Come on, doesn't she look amazing, right? I have really adored Tammy Faye as long as I've been aware of her. So when this opportunity came up, it was something that um, you can imagine a costume designer really wanted to get their hands on. Mitchell has a love for Tammy that I share. And it was very clear from our first conversation that we were on the same path in telling the story. Mitchell Travers, our costume designer, has created a story with the colors and the patterns. And as they progress, the world starts to get more chaotic. The color palette for the movie starts in a place that comes very much of the earth. It's pretty much limited towards browns and creams. As her universe expands, we start to see apricot, mint, navy, and then we break out to a place by the 80s where we're getting, I call it the Golden Girls palette, which is mauve, pink, pale blues, and then we get into this sort of hyper 80s extreme palette where we have shocking reds, blues. Every time someone's putting on something in the morning, it's their first act of how they're feeling that day or what they're trying to put out front. So it was like a psychology class of like, what was Tammy feeling right now? Or what would she want right now? As things were really great in her life, she was in a much more controlled palette. Her shapes were actually much more simple than people remember. And then as certain influences came into her life and certain people had a bit more control over parts of her life, you see that her personal control over her clothing shifts. So she starts to be wildly expressive. You get crazy metallics, you get sequins, you get an abundance of jewelry. He created this closet. I mean, there were over a hundred, there's probably 110 costumes or changes that he created. It's not an easy thing to do on a low budget film. I love the exuberance. I love the fearlessness. 
And for Jessica and I, it's an amazing opportunity to see some things on camera that we have sort of forgotten about the late 80s and give them some time in front of the camera again. At one point I said, I feel like this is something that she would love. And it makes me happy that we're showing her this way. I'm so excited, I'm just beside myself. She was always there and Mitchell made sure that she was always in some weird way, she was part of the decision making. God's been talking to me too, you know, Jim. And he said that I gotta speak up. Tammy was someone who believed we all wanted to be seen and loved and accepted and loved without judgment. I'm not gonna tell people who's going to hell, Jim. We're in the business of healing people. So if people could walk out of the film loving Tammy the way that I love her, and if they could learn to love others the way that she loved others, that to me is all I care about. Tammy Faye!